send us than any that's in this world. We're excited about all God has done, all that he's doing. I know when me and Miss Larley pray at night, we always thank God for everything he's brought us through, for this day that he's brought us to, and we thank God as we trust him together, our best days ahead ahead of us. Amen? You might not see it, you might not feel it, but if your faith is in God and his word, he'll do just as he said he would do. Amen? Well, we're going to go ahead and get started tonight. If you are a church member and you hadn't tithed, you can tithe anything above the tithes and offering. We'll go ahead and give you that opportunity now, and then we'll enter into praise and worship, as you well know. And then we got a word for you I believe will change your life. If you'll receive it and act on it, you'll never be the same. What do you say about your tithe? We looked at it some last week, really overall, not just about money, but he said that if you tithe, what would he do? To open the windows of your heaven, pour you out a blessing. There's not room enough to receive it. Y'all ought to know that by now. Amen. And we know that if you give, it's given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over with men, given to your bosom. We're not given to get, but as we are obedient to God and his plan, we'll God honor his word and multiply the seed to sown. Yes, the ushers can come. We're going to go ahead and give now, and we'll pray over our offerings together. We're going to speak the word. Amen. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I thank you for the privilege and opportunity to bring my tithes and offerings into the storehouse. You said in your word that if I would tithe, that you would open the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing that there's not room enough to receive. I thank you that right now, as I act on and obey your word, that the windows of heaven are opened up and the blessings of God are abounding in my life.
praise you, Father. We worship you, Lord. We're trading our sorrows. We're trading our shame. Amen. We're trading them in for the joy of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord. We glorify you, Lord. I'm trading all sorrows. And I'm trading all shame. And I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord.
of, of a statement of fact. Only you know the state of every heart and life of the people in this place. You know exactly where they are. I can open my eyes and see physically where they are, but you know where they are spiritually, mentally, emotionally, all of those things, Father. You know tomorrow, the future, better than we know the present and the past. You know what they've been through, Father, and we know the enemy's endeavored in many lives to attach things to them, different weights, different cares, baggage, so to speak, in the spirit. Not of God, obviously, but the enemy who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And saying that, you know the word from your word that they need tonight. We know that your word has within it the ability to order and change the course of their lives forever. And I believe as well as they have tonight, they've come with open hearts and minds, ready to receive what this said, the Spirit of God, through the Word of God. And as they receive this Word, it's going to do just what the Word does. When they're doers and not hearers only, it's going to change, challenge, and order their course of their lives forever. And we thank you, Father, tonight that they'll not leave this place like they came in Jesus' name, but they will be changed forever. And we thank you they'll leave here and shine and shed abroad out in this world. The lost, dying, and darkness of this world, they'll shine and they'll share the light of the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for that. We thank you, Father, the last amen, all is said and done this night. We'll give you the glory, you the honor, and you the praise you so deserve. We count it done by faith in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You can be seated. And if you have your Bibles, turn back to Malachi chapter 3. As we started last week, I always tell you, I always get started and get to going, and sometimes I'm going to think I'm going to preach for weeks on something, and I preach half of one service, then we move on. But if I go back home after service and the Lord keeps on building on it, I know I'm supposed to keep going, and he's been building and building and building, so we're going to go back to what we began talking about last week. This will be part two. I don't know how far we'll go. As I said, I got three or four parts already and still, still going. But God knows what's best for us, right? We're going to listen to him. Probably 15 years ago, I'd say, 12, 15, 17, somewhere in there, I don't know. Years ago, I was, I was pastoring, and, and we were going along, daily life. But I wasn't feeling hungry anymore. I didn't feel the fervency. I didn't feel the desire to walk with God. You know, the, the Bible says the Lord Jesus said over in Revelations, talking to the seven churches, said different things to each one. They apply to the church today. But he said about one of them, he said, you know, you're lukewarm. He said, I'd rather you be hot or cold. Not lukewarm, not tepid, not mediocre. I want you to make your decision. You know what you're going to do. And that's the way I felt at that time. And I began to pray and ask the Lord. I said, Lord, I'm not living in open sin. I'm not doing things that I know are wrong. Why do I feel this way? And we don't walk by our feelings, but we thank God we got a helper in the Holy Ghost. You, where you got questions, God has answers. Amen. And we thank God we, we know that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father and the Father and the Son are in heaven. But he said, I'll not leave you comfortless. He gave us the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, same being, same person. And he's here with us and he lives inside of us. And as you ask and, and you learn how to commune or communicate with the Holy Spirit, he'll lead you and guide you in all truth. I said, Lord, I don't feel hungry like I was before. What's wrong with me? And he just asked me a simple question. He said, well, think back to what you were doing when you were hungry, on fire and full of God. He said, what were you doing? I said, well, I was studying and praying. I was focused on you above all else, and I was reading behind mighty men and women of God that walked in the anointing that I desire to walk in. He said, well, if you want, if you want it to be like it used to be, all you got to do is go back to doing what you used to do. That's very simple, isn't it? Right? He said, if you want it to be like it used to be, all you got to do is go back to doing what you used to do. Why? Because what do you reap? Your harvest is based on what? What you sow. And he was just telling me it's not as complicated as you think it is. He said, at this time, you've allowed some things to get your focus and your priority. And, and we're going back to what we were talking about. And I told you, although he's starting with the tithing scriptures, matter of fact, I've got it wrote in my Bible, I mean in my notebook. Don't write it down because it's not the title. I was starting out talking about the tithe. The title was going to be the test of the tithe. But, but don't, don't, that's just going to be one of our examples. It's the principle of first or first things. And this is part two. But we started in Malachi chapter three. And, and we'll look down, go to verse seven. Uh, I need to review just a little bit, but 
If you were here last week, all of this review will be in your notes, most of it anyways. We'll add as the Spirit leads to it, but leads us to it. But, but if you were not here, obviously it's available online and CDs and all that good stuff. You can go back and listen to it. It'll help you. So why are you ministering this? Because it's, it's what God knows where you are. He knows where I'm at. Spiritually speaking, he knows what we need. He said in verse 3 of Malachi, not verse 3, chapter 3, verse 7. And remember the, the Israelites under the Mosaic law, they were required to give a tenth of everything, produce, livestock, to the Lord, or, or they could redeem, uh, redeem it with money and add a fifth part. We talked about that last week. The tithes were in addition to all kinds of numerous offerings. We're not teaching you on those things. We're focusing on one point. And they were an acknowledgement that everything they had belonged to God and that he was the giver of all possessions. Did you know in a great sense, everything you have belongs to God? He's entrusted you. You're a steward and a manager, right? We'll talk more about that later. But it's verse 7, even from the days of your fathers, you're gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them return unto me and i'll return unto you we said the scripture over in the new testament that correlates with that is what james 4 8 he said if you draw not to me right i'll draw not to you you get serious with god and he'll get serious with you return unto me and i'll return unto you saith the lord of hosts but you said wherein shall you we return and he said in verse 8 will a man rob god you have robbed me but you say Wherein have you robbed thee? And, and what was his answer? In tithes and offerings. Now, we, we looked at Leviticus 27.30. I don't want you turning to all these because we don't have time. He said in Leviticus 27.30, he said, In all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. And we pulled out of that scripture, rightfully so, all the tithe belongs to who? All the tithe belongs to the Lord. And again, we're starting out, this is talking about money. It includes money. This is not a message just on money. We're talking about the whole of your life. When he said over in Matthew 6, to seek him first, he wasn't talking about just you give an offering or a tithe. He's talking about the first of your attention, the first and best of your life, right? The Living Bible of Leviticus 27, 30 said, a, a tenth of the produce of the land, whether grain or fruit, it is the Lord's and it is holy. We looked at Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. Honor the Lord with the first fruits of all thine increase. And then the result would be in verse 10, so shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. We said, the Holy Spirit said, it's in line with the scripture, in every area of your life, when you give God the first, the rest is blessed. Right? Right? When you give God the first, the rest is blessed. And don't turn me off because we're starting talking about money. Matter of fact, all your money, it ought to belong to God anyways. But I'm not here to talk to you to try to twist your arm or pull some tricks to get you to give more money. That's not the topic. We're talking about the whole and the sum of your life. Proverbs 3, 9 in the Amplified says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your crops or income. Message says, give him the first and the best. And, and that's obviously, you know, that's what we're moving into. Give him the first and the best. So if we looked at the tithe, what is the tithe anyways? It's the first 10%, right? It's 10%, but it's the first 10%. And offerings anything above the tithe. And again, that's what God prompts you in your heart uh, to give above the tithe but in malachi 3 we go back to it it says in verse 9 you're cursed with a curse for you have robbed me even this whole nation he said in verse 10 bring the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house and prove me now herewith saith the lord of hosts if i not open you the windows of heaven pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it I rebuke the devourer for your sake, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed. We're living in a daytime and season where we need to be the light of the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel and the kingdom in the darkness of this world. The way that we're going to be blessed and walk in the fullness of all God has for us is to give him our best. 
And as we give him our best, the rest will be blessed everywhere we go and everything we do, regardless of what's going on outside, when you're obeying God from the heart because the true soul, the seed is the word, but the true soul is not out yonder in the yard and it's not your bank account. The true soul is your heart. The word is the seed. The seed is sown in your heart and your heart should ultimately, the whole of it, belong to God, Jesus, yeah, both both right. But still, Oral Roberts said this, in the law of the seed or the miracle of seed faith, I can't remember the name of the book, but it's awesome. I've read it a few times. He said, my tithe is not a debt I owe, but it's a seed I sow. That's what he said. He said, my tithe is not a, a debt I owe. That's one of the best books I've read. My tithe is not a debt I owe, but it's a seed that I sow right? We look at giving it to the Lord because it belongs to him. But in essence, what he is saying is I have increased you. I have given you all these things. I have increased you. Whatever you have is increase of God. And, and all I'm asking for you is to give me what's rightfully mine. And we know that tithing, if we want to look at it properly, it's really God's management system to see if he can promote you to the next level. Because if he can trust you by managing the 10% where you are, what can he do? If he can trust you where you are, he can promote you to the next level. Many people are looking for harvest, for promotion, for moving up, for increase, and that doesn't need to be the focus. The focus needs to be the faithfulness right where you are with what God has already entrusted you with. That's the most important thing is being faithful right now today with who I'm with, with what God's entrusted me with, right? Say, so what is my ministry? Ministry, by definition, goes right along with serving. It's whatever you bring, whatever supply, whatever God's gifted you, whatever supply you bring, be faithful. Glorify God with all your wealth, the passion says of verse 9, Proverbs 3. Honor him with your very best, with every increase that comes to you. And, and then we went down and we saw Malachi 3, we just read through this. New Testament Christians, we know that we're no longer under the law, and I'm not telling you that we are. That wouldn't be right, right? That would be wrong. I'm not going to tell you that. Proverbs chapter 24, 1, you, hadn't, you don't have this yet, but write it down. This is, this is actually the little bit of a message I was going to preach to begin with. Proverbs 21, write that down, 24, 1, and 1 Corinthians 10, 26. It's just two scriptures that say the same thing. It says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. You say, well, I thought you said Satan was the God of this world. So we talk about Adam's lease is going to run out. It's about to run out. When Adam sinned, he gave his authority over to Satan in this world. But the earth and the fullness thereof belongs to God. And Adam's lease is running out, and we thank God things are going to be fully righted, and we're all going to take back over, or God's taking back over, right? We understand that, at least in some measure. Everything that God gives me increases me. The first belongs to who? It belongs to God. What I do with the first will depend on the blessing or lack thereof of the rest. Miles Monroe, anybody ever heard of him? I saved this from several years ago. He's in heaven now. He passed several years ago. But he wrote this. This is a section in a book. And it says the reason why God created tithing. Tithing has nothing to do with giving God money. He doesn't need your money. He doesn't lack anything. He doesn't need anything in that sense. Right? Uh, we covered last week or either Sunday morning, I don't remember. But a lot of people say the plan of redemption and salvation. The reason God did that is because he had to be a need to be loved. That's not biblical. For God so loved that he gave. He gave his only son because he loved you. You're the object of his affection. It's covenant love. It wasn't, he didn't do it because of what he could get out of it, right? We owe him everything, but he first chose us. He first loved us, right? This is still in the same section of a book is what it is. But he said, tithing and offerings, tithes and offerings is God's management training program for human beings. God doesn't need a penny from us, and yet he tells us 100% of everything is his. And he said, he made this statement. He said, we think that's only about money, and that causes us many problems because it's not right. This is what he said. 
He said, if you get 10 shoes, one of them's not yours. He said a lot of things just to prove a point. He was an excellent writer. He said, if you get 10 dresses, one of them's not yours. If you get 10 oranges, one of them's not yours. He said, you get 24 hours in a day, two hours and 40 minutes doesn't belong to you. That's what he said now, so don't get mad at me. He said, you're a thief every day if you don't give two hours and 40 minutes to God, a time thief. He said, if you can spend two hours, four hours, and eight hours watching cable television, but you can't give two hours and 40 minutes that belongs to God, how are you going to be able to manage anything else? God can in any time and in any minutes command you to give that dress away. Me and Jay's free of charge. We're good. We don't have no dresses. I hope none of you fellas do. It doesn't belong to you. Tithing and offering is not about money. It's about management. It's about discipline. It's about faithfulness. It's about can God trust you? Can you consistently tithe? God said, put aside 10% of everything for his purpose. We looked at different times, Deuteronomy 8, 18. What's the two primary purposes of God's plan for your provision and wealth? He gives you power to get wealth, but what's the two purposes? Number one, to build his kingdom. Number two, to bless mankind. But as we attach the laws of sowing and reaping to that, and as you obey God in those areas, and you are sowing as he instructs you to, what happens to the seed that you sow? It increases so you've got more to give, and it keeps going back and forth. And again, I'm trying to get your mind off money, but I guess we need to finish this article first. But this is what it's about. He said, put aside 10% of everything for my purpose, that's tithing. 100% belongs to God. And he said, put aside that 10% for his work, leaving 90%. He said, but it still, in a great sense, belongs to God. So then if God owns everything, why will he allow you to put aside 10% if everything belongs to him? Because it's not just about money. It's about your ability to put it aside, your will, your control, your self-discipline to put it aside. He is after your discipline. If you can manage the 10% properly, then he's happy to trust you with the 90%, but because you have been unfaithful with the 10%, you keep losing the 90% and end up with no percent. Look at Matthew 25 along these lines. Some of these things I've had in my holster for years and I hadn't breathed a word about it. This is actually one of them. But Matthew 25, we got the parable. The stewardship is what my Bible says, but the parable of the talents. And, and if we looked at Matthew 25, we would see, we could look at all of it, but we see to begin with here, in verse 20 we'd say, he that received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou hast... Thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. Verse 21, his Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He said, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have been what? You have been faithful. He was faithful with what he had been entrusted with. And what was the result of that? You know, that's the purpose of the first. The principle of the first or first things is what? The Christian, the believer, puts who first? God first is the first, and, first commandment. First and greatest commandment out of Matthew 24 is what? We're to do what? The first commandment is... The greatest commandment is to love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Secondly, to love your neighbor as yourself. You'll, you'll watch people, always watch people. As they begin to get serious with God, you'll see their actions change. You can see it. It starts inside, but they'll start taking spiritual things more serious. They'll start taking even church attendance more serious. People say, well, it's not about that. Well, you know. The reality of it is, is God's created the fivefold ministry. One of them being a pastor who seeks God on your behalf, and he is preparing you seed. Seed from the word that has the ability to change your life. 
and people in the church cannot figure out what is wrong and what is happening and why nothing goes right. The life-changing seed was delivered. But if your priorities are not in order enough or you don't care enough to come receive it and apply it and do it, it is not God's fault or nobody else's fault because things don't go right. The seed is made available. Matter of fact, this book right here is what? The Word, what's Luke 8, 13? The Word is the seed. This is a book of seeds. I've had people that took pride in how many scriptures they could quote. The Lord delivered me from this. There's nothing wrong with quoting scriptures. You need to know them. But you don't receive fruit. I've had a vision about people and even ministries before that they took pride in. We know the word. We're a word church. I had a vision of them. And they were walking around, weighted down, and they had bags of seed on their shoulders. They was pushing wheelbarrows and pulling wagons full of seed. You know how much good that is? Zero if you don't plant it. None. It'll help you none. You could look back. Well, no. Let's look at Matthew 25. You read that. You saw in verse 21, well done, thy good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. It's not beneficial to you. It serves no purpose to you. If you'll not tithe and give where you are, it's, it's, it's foolishness to believe God to operate and move into a greater level, a greater sphere of responsibility if you're not willing to be faithful where you are. It won't work. God will never promote you. 25, verse 21, this was the one that, that kept, well, let's read 24. We read 21. He that had received the one talent, Matthew 25, 24, came and said, Lord, I knew thee that you're a hard man reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. Verse 25, and I was afraid. Faith and fear are opposites. I was afraid, and I went and hid the talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not sowed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury, or usury, have you say that, but it's, it's obviously it's interest, but still, why did he not sow in verse 25? He said, I was afraid. But what's insured if you don't give God the first? What's insured if you don't sow? I got a message on the law of the seed, and, and I've never got to preach it, but it's awesome. And, and they don't have, they got it back there, but it's probably, I, got them, I was going to preach it one Sunday morning, and, and I got them to take, I took some pictures, got Logan to take it, and they, I took, does anybody know? There's a big old oak tree right out front here, and it's monstrous, and it's beautiful. It's been there my whole life. If I told you today that I held that oak tree in my hand, and I brought it in here with me in my pocket, y'all do got it. That's a big tree, and, and the screen don't even do it justice. But if I told you that I had that oak tree in my pocket, if I told you that I held that oak tree in my hand, most people would say you're crazy. It's very often why we don't step out in faith on the small things. Don't despise small beginnings. You say, how in the world would you hold that oak tree in your hand? Although it's a process to get an oak tree, that's an acorn. You know what this is? It's seed. That goes back to the book of beginnings. Seed time and harvest, sowing and reaping, giving and receiving. All the same thing. This is seed. This has the ability to produce that. This, I'm holding to my hand. Is that not absurd? That's why if you went to Mark 4, we'll go there later probably. It talks about seed time and harvest. It says he sowed the seeds. He sows the seed and then he goes to sleep. And there's a part in there we have a, a struggle with. It says that, that it springs forth and produces fruit, but he knoweth not how. You don't understand the process. It's the miracle of the seed. The life of the seed is where? It's in itself. Yeah, you plant it, it. You would think it's rotten and dying, but it's really not. 
Let's come back from the mountains one time this time of year, of course, for my family. And I was, I was going down through there, and all the leaves were so beautiful coming back down through there. And that beauty, the Lord said, what had to proceed? What's going on right now? The, the whole tree wasn't, but there had to be death to produce life. It's always that way. God, out of his love, so it, he always operates on the law of the seed, always. He sowed his first and best, we talked about, I think, last week, to do what? To redeem us. Jesus came and was born of a virgin in the Holy Ghost in the form of a seed. You say, this is that tree, this has the ability to produce that. But if for whatever reason, I keep this in my desk drawer, I keep it in my hand, I put it in my pocket, or I throw it in the trash, what will it produce? Whatever my reason is for not, see, we get caught up in little things, and this is so dangerous in the church. I see it all the time. It grieves my spirit, and I know it grieves the Holy Spirit. People have taken, and, and, and I'm not saying all of you do, you're here on Wednesday night, but people have taken an approach and they are apathetic. It, it, it's it's the, nothing, spiritual things, and it doesn't matter. It seems sometimes even things that are so important, it's like, nah, don't matter. It does matter. It's life-changing. Everything matters. Don't let people lie to you. People say, well, God loves you anyways. He loves you anyways, but I promise you, he'll love you till the day you die. But if you hold fast to the seed, whatever it is that God has instructed you, whatever words come from heaven to your spirit, whatever words come from that word, which is the book of seeds, if you don't sow it, he will love you, but you'll never accomplish his will. You'll never. Inside every single one of you, you fellas, you got to have a woman, believe it or not. It takes a man and a woman. He created us to be dependent upon each other. You, you know, every one of you guys, there's a family inside of you. I said there's a family inside of you. There's future generations inside of you. We're going to sow the seed of God's word. We're going to take serious things serious. People that are apathetic, the Lord had me to look that word up, I knew in a measure what it meant, but it's really, eh, I really don't care. I don't really care one or the other. But I do care whether I accomplish God's will. I do care whether I become the man God's called me to be. I do care whether I reach the people that he wants us to reach. I do care. Sometimes we say things and we don't even realize it. I was studying, I'm not preaching on it, but in precatory prayers or prayers of judgment while I was studying intercession. And he said, people don't realize it, but while there are people in the earth that are dying and going to hell, when you say all the time because of how bad things are, Lord, come quickly, you're actually desiring judgment on people and they're going to go to hell. I want to accomplish the will of God in the earth. I want us to reach as many people as possible and I want to see the law saved before we check out of here. It's not just about me getting out. We don't have an escapism mentality. We got a plan to accomplish. You got a purpose to fulfill. You say, I don't see the whole thing. What are you doing with today? What are you doing with the seed that you've been given? I found this repeatedly in my life, praying about revelation. If the revelation ever slows down in my life, the Lord will always ask me, what are you doing with the last revelation I gave you? What's a revelation anyways but a word from the Lord? What's a word? Seed. If I'll be faithful where I'm at with what I have, what will happen? I'll be increased. When I'm faithful where I'm at, so what does that have to do with things? Well, look at Luke. Go to Matthew 4. We were talking about it anyways. We talked last week about putting him first in Matthew 6, 33. Matthew 6, 24, we know no man can serve two masters. You go into Mark 4, 26. What is the principle of first? It's the first and the best of all that I have. All that I am and all that comes to me, the first of it belongs to God. 
That principle of first, whether you take tithing or not, which you can't, and throw it in the trash can, it goes right into the New Testament. Amen? Yes. I know from experience and from the Word. But I ask you the question, what is God's place in our lives? First, he said, you'll have no other God before me. Right? And of course, what you do first, what you give the most of your attention to, reveals your priorities. Wherever your treasure is, the Bible says in Matthew 6, there, there your heart be also. Right? That's, that's 21 of Matthew 6. We read last week or quoted it, 1 John 5, 21, NLT, dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. You see today, that's one of the biggest issues is so many things going on and so much distraction that even many well-meaning Christians don't have time for God. And we could sit around and talk about everybody else, but we need to do what Dr. Hagen used to say, including myself. We need to put our shovels down and say, how does this apply to me? Right? For the Christian, the principle of first is always making sure that God is first and that he gets the best of all that we are and all that we have. I just said that, but it bears repeating. Nothing will go right until you get this. The beginning of anything always governs or sets the direction of all that follows. So who do we want to keep first? God, Mark 4, 26, so is the kingdom, Jesus said, of God, is if a man should cast seed into the ground. This is how the kingdom of God operates. It's how it works. This little teeny few scriptures. I was raised in a church that taught faith all of my life, and I never understood faith until this message was taught to me at Ramah by Pastor Charles Cowan. In three services during camp meeting many years ago, it kicked this off for me. I began to understand faith. I'd heard it my whole life, not knocking anybody that's taught it. It could have been the state of my heart. You can't always blame the preacher, I promise. A lot of people try, but we all have a responsibility in this thing. But this is, I've got it wrote in my Bible, how faith works. It says, so is the kingdom of God as a man should do what? Cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day and the seed should spring and grow up and as I mentioned a while ago this is where we have a difficulty sometimes he knoweth not how you ever notice a lot of times when you act on the word and sow the seed a lot of times it looks worse and better then you have to go back to the word and say what has God said did God mean what he said and will he honor his word if I hold fast to the confession of my faith and I stay in obedience and I stay on the course in the way that God's called me regardless of what it looks like on any given day, will God do what he said? Now, many of y'all are sitting here, but Jay is, tells his testimony a lot about getting up and tithing and giving and when they, what they come from to where they are now and where they are now is not where they're going, right? Where you are now is not where you're going. And I mean that in a good way. But there's been different times and they got down to nothing, just about negative. And you can ask Jay, he'd call me and, and he would talk about it. He said he's sitting there riding his lawnmower. And I asked him every time, I said, are you still tithing? Are you still giving? Yes, sir. I said, but then you know what works and you know what's going to happen. God's going to do exactly what he said he would do. He'll open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. There's not room enough to receive it. It wasn't Miss Jessica, but I was talking to Rusty not too long ago. And Rusty was talking, they had talked to me and Laura Lee one time before about what they desired and what they had in their hearts for their family. And they could tell you better than me, but they don't mind me telling them it's too late now, <laughs> telling the gist of it. But Rusty had talked to me, and this has been just a few days, weeks ago at the most. But he's talking to me, and he said, Pastor, when you minister the messages sometimes, he said, it's not that me and Jessica don't want to come down. He said, but a lot of times you're talking about not giving up and talking about keeping on going and talking about the fiery trial and all this kind of stuff. And he said, we just don't feel like we even need to go up there at this time. He said, but I don't want, I don't want to be doing something wrong. And I said, Rusty, if that's the season that you're in, enjoy it. I said, but don't you understand something? Hard times will come and you'll trust God and you'll go through. I said, but what a lot of people don't realize is when you do what you and Jessica have done, when you get the word, when you sow the word, and when you do the word, you can avoid half the problems most people face. You won't have the same problems. 
Many people are struggling because either they've not sown the right seed or they have sown the wrong seed. You know, the Bible says, I can't remember who I heard this from, but it just stuck with me and it is, I hope it sticks with you forever. Mark eleven twenty two, we quote it all the time. It says, have, Jesus said, have faith in God. 23 said, whoever, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, shall not doubt, doubt in his heart, but believe those things which he saith shall come to pass. He'll have whatsoever he saith. Then 24 says, what things soever you desire. When you pray, believe you receive it and you'll have it. And this, this minister made this statement, and he was saying what another minister said. So I don't know how, where, who it came from, but it had to come from God because it's in line. He said, you know, you'll have what you say. So no matter what you say, you need to add this on it. If you believe faith in God and you believe the seed is the word, and when you sow the seed, you reap the harvest based on the seed sown, this is what you should say. When you say, I can't pay my bills, add this to it. And I want it that way. When you say, I can't make it, I can't get up to look a snake in the eyes, and I want it that way. I can't get out of all of this mess that's in my family, and I want it to stay that way. That gives it a new view. What should you be saying? That's what the Word says. I got the wisdom of God. I got the favor of God. Does it always feel like it? Does it always look like it? The Word's got nothing to do with feelings. Your feelings line up later. People get bogged and say, I, I can't get over this, and I want it to stay that way. You'll have what you say. And people say, well, that's not the whole thing. No, but it's part of it. It's not the whole thing, but it's part of it. That's why a lot of your Christian friends, you'd be better off if you leave them alone. Because people get in Christian groups and just share their feelings, and they all feel good because they're all telling everybody, this situation's worse than yours, and, and theirs is worse than theirs. Everybody tell me how bad it is. We need groups to get together and talk about how good God is and how if we'll just trust him, he'll bring us out. It shocked me at different times throughout my life. I've been in places, even in church, and sat down with people and began to talk about God and how good he was, and people got up and moved away. They want to talk about something else. That's in church. I ain't talking about a town. And I just was baffled. That's been a long time ago. I was just shocked. I was like, man, I, I figured Christians would want to hear how good God is. If it rubs you the wrong way, when somebody talks about how good God is and he wants to bring you out, there's some issues. People say, you just don't know what I'm dealing with and what I'm facing. But you just don't know what God's able to do if you'll trust him with what you're dealing and what you're facing. He's able. He said, and it should, and should sleep, 27, and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow. He knoweth not how, for the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself. First the blade. It's a process. Faith is not magic. There's no pixie and fairy dust. It doesn't work that way. It's the getting, the gathering, the receiving of the seed of the word, sowing the seed by confessing in your mouth and believing in your heart. And if there's a condition in the promise, you have to meet the condition. You've got to be doers of the word and not hearers only, James 1.22. If there's a condition in the promise, you must meet the condition to qualify for the blessings that are guaranteed in the promise. There's different ones in here that we, we pray. I don't know everybody's situation, but I have people to tell me that they tell me a, 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 some of their business more than others. But what they tell me, with it being true, and I believe it, is easy for us to, me and Laura Lee, some of the things that people ask us to agree about. It makes it easy because I know what they believe, and I know what they do. When, somebody, when we're believing God for somebody concerning financial things, and that's all I'll say, and we know they're faithful tithers and givers. It makes it easy because we know they qualify. It's easy. But will you ever reap where you don't sow, according to the Bible? But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle because the harvest is come. So we see, let's, let's ask ourselves this. What determined the seed springing up, the seed growing, the seed producing fruit, the process of growth taking place, the harvest arriving? What action preceded all of that? What's first? 
always. What better be first is what God said should be first. You will never, would God, I got it wrote on my dry erase board, last time I read it was this morning, whatever you give to God, you never lose. What you keep, you lose with God. That's why you got to renew your mind with the word. And what you give, you gain. Because whatever you give to God, what's he do with it? He multiplies it and he blesses it. It it makes no natural sense. I understand that, but we're not in the natural, we're in the spiritual. Oral Roberts, we know, Oral Roberts University, he's in heaven now, but we went out, Jan Morgan too, the girls, went out and and, and toured Oral Roberts University. And and it's, it's, it's just amazing. It's just the whole, I mean, it's just, it's shocking. At the state of the art facilities, you would think after all these years it'd be run down, all this kind of stuff. It's not. It's nice. It's awesome. We went up in the prayer tower where people's praying 24 hours a day and all this kind of stuff, and it overlooks the whole campus. It's covered in prayer. But he, in the miracle of the seed, Oral well, Robert said he had a, he, and he started teaching his, his, his people this at the school, and he said he had a young girl that come to him, and she said, I want to do this, and I want to do that, and I want to do the other, the help of the ministry, but I don't have time. I don't have enough time to get done what I need to get done. And he explained the message of the miracle of seed faith to her, that whatever you sow, whatever you give to God, he multiplies, and he said, I know this isn't going to make any sense to you. He said, but you already don't have enough time already. He said, find somewhere you can help and serve a day, 30 minutes to an hour a day, and just sow your time and watch what God does. And he said, I didn't even think about it no more. He said, it didn't cross my mind no more. He said, but she come running up to me several months later and started telling me her testimony. And she said she got involved over here and began to give her her time when she didn't have enough time. And her whole schedule changed around. Her whole life changed around. Now she was putting God first. And she didn't even realize what she was doing fully, but she was putting God first. And what else happened? Everything lined up. That kind of sounds like Matthew 6, 33. What preceded, Mark 4, what preceded all of this, the initial action of the seed sown, right? The first step is not just a step, but it is an action that directly affects everything that follows. Luke 6, 38. So we had to be careful for these things and these these fellows and ladies, whoever's taking up the offering, but it's right because it is about money and finance, but it's not all it's about. Let's back up to 37 to prove that. He said, Jesus said, Luke 6, he's been talking about introducing the love of God. He used Matthew more than, than Luke, but it's the same thing said differently. Verse 37 of Luke 6, he said, judge not and you shall not be judged. And that's talking about improper judging. We're supposed to judge, he told us in John 7, 24, we're to judge rightly or the righteous judgment, right? Condemn not and you shall not be condemned. Forgive and you shall be forgiven. Is that that so in a reading? Now, if you're praying with somebody, you're laying hands on somebody, you're endeavoring to believe God for somebody, you can fast and pray for three days for them to get over something they're facing and you find out they're walking in unforgiveness. If you pray the rest of your life, they'll never get set free because they're simply reaping the harvest of the seed that's sown. They got to change what they're doing. Judge not that you be not judged. Condemn not and you shall not be condemned. Forgive and you shall be forgiven. Then he said in verse 38, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over shall men give unto your bosom for the same measure that you meet with all it shall be measured to you again. Now many people have taken the message of prosperity and provision and run around quoting every man and men are given unto me people are looking for me to bless me well that sounds real good but you better check what you're giving that's why you don't hear me saying that all the time i'm more focused on qualifying for the blessing than running around telling everybody things if i don't give i should never expect anything to be multiplied 
Have you ever not put anything in the bank and go try to make a withdrawal? You look funny up at the ATM if you've never made a deposit trying to get money out. And you can get mad at the bank, you get mad at other people, you can get mad at the teller, get mad at anything you want to. The problem is nothing was ever deposited. Nothing was ever put there. So what proceeds you receive an increase of anything in your life? The Bible even says, if you want friends. I mean, we're just here to tell the truth. I'm about to let you go. So if you want friends, I've had people to tell me this. It's not anybody that's here now. They say, I don't understand why nobody likes me. And my next thought is everybody I know can answer that question. You are a pain in the rear. And we love you and God loves you, but you're a pain. When people see you coming, they get a feeling and it ain't the spirit of God. It's how fast can I run and how fast can I hide? Can I avoid them if possible? But if you want friends, I can't count the people that have been upset because other people do not respect them in their opinion. Are you respectful? Who do you respect? People in authority, even leaders in this church. I say this all the time. There is no level of authority that gives you a right to get out of the love of God and mistreat other people. It's unacceptable. I don't care what position you have. It's unacceptable. Under all circumstances, and if you miss it, you repent and ask people to forgive you. It's unacceptable. I detest it. I can't stand it. Because people don't qualify to lead anybody if you can't treat the person on the lowest rung of the ladder just like you would the top person. There's something wrong with you inside i don't have a lot of patience with that so well, that nobody respects me nobody listens to me who do you respect and who do you listen to if it's nobody then you just reap what you sow i think one of the worst things that's ever happened as far as with the church is when we come to the place where we see church is sunday morning and wednesday night this is a word for daily living is throughout the entire fabric of your life. It works at home. It works at work. It works at Walmart. It works at church, obviously, but it works everywhere you go. You could change your life by determining and change. Many people, and I'm ahead of myself, but I'm not going much further tonight, but the reality of it is this. Many people think we need a move of the Holy Ghost more than ever before where people are getting hands laid on. People, I've been in services with people slain in the spirit. I'm not saying it's not legitimate. I'm not. My, my studies personally right now is on the Great Commission all the way through the gifts of the Holy Ghost, the move of God, uh, the, the signs following, demonstration, manifestation of the Holy Ghost to confirm the word. I believe all of it. But if a person has a wrong mindset and they're making wrong decisions, they're sowing wrong seed, and they're reaping a wrong harvest, no amount of the anointing, no amount of somebody laying hands on you until they wear all the hair off your head will change the harvest that you're receiving in your life. The only thing that will change the harvest is you making the decision to renew your mind with the word, which is a seed, and change the seed that you're sowing. And when you begin to change the seed that you sow, what will change? Automatically, the harvest will change, right? Right? Because the harvest reveals the seed sown. Amen? God's word says, 38 is Luke 6, give and you'll receive a large quantity, pressed together, shaken together, and running over will be put into your pocket. The standards you use for others will be applied to you. That kind of sounds like the golden rule. The standards you use for others will be applied to you. You know, the stumbling block, if we're not careful sometimes, that's tripping us up can be our own selves. It's been years ago now, and I had not arrived now. I'm further along than I used to be, and I think Ms. Laura Lee would attest to that. we both further along than we used to be, thank God. But there was a service in this church when the sanctuary was turned the other way. I can't remember which one of it was. 
that, that this happened to us happened two or three times or so. But, but the Spirit of God moved, and I came out here, and I was praying one day. I prayed the whole service out in the Holy Ghost. And, and I was in the, sitting here, I was in here by myself, and I was praying, and the Lord said, this is what I want to do. That next day, it was one of the days that we prayed for some one of those ladies. I don't know who it was, but you guys gathered around, and it's by the power of the Spirit. If you was here and saw it, you know it, it happened because we can't make it up. But the, somebody had back problems, that one leg was shorter than the other, and their leg shot out just like that to be equal with the other one. Everybody said that was great, and that's mighty, and we believe in God for a great move of God. You said, I don't believe that. Well, just get ready because you're going to see plenty more of it. Search out some of Brother Hagin's videos on YouTube there. Other people too, but search out his videos, even in the old reels. He said, in the name of Jesus, I command you to be healed, and you can see one that much further than the other. You see it begin to shake. You watch it on video grow right out. They didn't have all that stuff to trick everybody back then. There was no AI. There were still people that was full of bull, but there was no AI. There's always been that. But the Lord spoke to me sitting there, and he said, now this is my plan for tomorrow. I, don't, I can't even remember what it was about. And I might have considered it insignificant, but, but God didn't. He said, but this is what you said or how you treated Laura Lee, and I want you to make it right. And if you don't, my plan for tomorrow will not come to pass. What was he showing me? Because he doesn't love me? No. It's beneficial for me, for Miss Laura Lee, and for everybody we're called to minister to that I allow, I remove every hindrance in my heart and life. Keith Moore said this, and I'm, I'm for a move of the Holy Ghost. We're going in greater than ever before. I believe his mama or grandmama was an old Methodist lady. And, and when they got into this with Brother Hagin and them, and they was, uh, you know, filled with the Holy Ghost, and they was praising God and doing all kind of stuff, and he said she wouldn't attack it. He said, but she had wisdom. And he said, I sat down and talked with her, and, and I wanted her input. And he, she, all she would say was, Keith, it don't matter how high you jump on Sunday. It don't matter how many chandeliers you swing from on Sunday. What really matters is where you land on Monday. That's revelation, and it's good. Many people are looking for a move, and they need to examine a seed. Am I sowing the right seed to reap the harvest that God intends and wills? And we know this is the will of God. Amen? Message. Give away your life. You'll find life given back to you. But not merely giving back, giving back with bonus and blessing. Don't you like that? Giving, not getting, is the way. Generosity begets generosity. And we'll go, I hope we get to go back. We'll look in the beginning, the law of the seed with Adam and Eve. God didn't just tell them to, what to do, same way with you and me. He didn't just tell them what to do. He told them to be fruitful and multiply. And it's the same way with Noah. When Noah come off the ark and there was nothing left there and they had the animals, of course, male and female. It takes male and female to produce more male and females, right? That's seed time and harvest too. But we've talked about this before and he come off the ark and, and, and he's looking out there and everything might look barren and people said there was no way he's going to replenish the earth again. But what did Noah have? He had seed. He had seed and soil. If you got seed and soil, you can produce a harvest. So God told Adam and Eve, it started out in Genesis. Genesis 8.22 said, as long as the earth remains, one of the things that will remain is the seasons, but seed time and harvest will remain. This is how God operates. What seed are you sowing today? Are you giving God the first and the best of the whole of your life? I'm not talking about what you put in the offering bucket on, on Sunday. That's a part of it, but that's not the whole of it. The first and best of the whole of my life belongs to God, and when I give it to him, do I lose anything? No. I can't wait to some of the examples we get to. How many times with the loaves and the fishes in all sorts of different situations where there's 15, 20 people, and he said, what is it, John 6, where he did with Philip, he said, give it to you. He said, it even says there, Jesus said, he did this to prove him. Prove me the test. And he said, give me what you got. Even though he didn't have enough, what was he saying? 
if you'll take the act of giving me sowing a seed of what you got, then what happened? When they gave God the first and the best, he broke it and blessed it and multiplied it and gave it back to them, and they didn't just have enough. They had more than enough. Kind of sounds like the scriptures on tithing and giving. You look at the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. There's not room enough to receive it. Giving will be given back to you, good measure. Press down, shaking together, right? Who's it going to benefit in your family? If you give the whole of your life to God, everybody, everybody around you will glorify and thank God. And I'm joking and being serious. Nobody will be upset. Miss Laurie, don't bother me in the morning when I get up. First thing to give the first and the best to God. She says, please take him up there. Because that's not just better for me. It's not just better for the church. It's better for my family. You can become who God's called you to be. But you're going to have to make the decision to give the first and best to God and plant the seed that he's giving you. Because if you eat the seed, in essence, what happens? What are you doing? And I'm closing right now, but what are you doing if instead of giving the first and the best to God, if you take it for yourself, the reality of it is, is you're actually eating the seed that you should sow and forfeiting the harvest that's as sure as the seed sown if you'd only sow it. Stand to your feet. Father, we come before you right now in Jesus' name. We love you and thank you for this day. Your many blessings, your hand upon us, your spirit leading to God us. Thank you for who you are, all that you've done. Father, I know that we have been there numerous times. I can speak for myself. Many of us already have the seed of the word. I might even can preach this and they could say, well, I know that. that. That doesn't produce fruit. That doesn't produce a harvest to know it. That's where it starts. But faith is an act. And we think it's the act of receiving the word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And it's sowing the word, confessing it and believing it. And of course, if there's a condition in the promise, we must meet it. If we expect it to work in our life and it'll work every time as we trust you, every head bowed and every eye closed, maybe you're here tonight and you say, Pastor, I don't know this Jesus is Lord in my life. I don't know if I was to die right now and go to heaven. I don't know that I'm a child of God. Well, thank God that he gave his first and best. When there was no way, he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, to die and shed his innocent blood to pay the price to redeem us from our sins. We thank you, Father, you accepted that price as payment for our sins. And judicially speaking, we are forgiven in Jesus' name. In Christ, we're already forgiven. You're here tonight and you say, I want you to pray with me to make Jesus Lord of your life. Flip your hand up boldly right where you're at and I'd be glad to pray with you. Anybody in the place, it's not complicated, but it's where it starts. That's a seed that you've been given. But if you hear it at every church service, hear it everywhere else, you hear it every time, and you don't take that seed and sow it by acting on it, it'll not produce salvation in your life although he's freely given it to you number two you say i'm a christian i have no doubt that i've got out of fellowship with god well the seed says if you confess with your mouth excuse me, if you confess your sins he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness so you missed it you fail come short of the glory whatever it may be what does the bible say if i confess that i've sinned what will god do so i got a part and then God does a part. It's always that way. I say, Father, I missed it. I ask you to forgive me. Just like that, forgiven, cleansed, washed in the blood. You're here tonight, you want me to pray with you to rededicate your heart and life to God. Slip your hand up boldly. I'll be glad to pray with you. Anybody in the place, anybody else, you got any special need or a prayer request? Do you come down now? I'll be glad to pray with you, whatever it may be. Doesn't really matter. We'll pray with you. Set our faith with yours. Act on the word. Sow the seed and expect a harvest. I want to make clear this before I let you go right now. We are moving in to things of the Spirit greater than ever before. Amen? I don't want you to think with what I said that I meant. We're going a different way because we're not. We're going God's way. And we thank God for the Word. We thank God for the Holy Ghost. We thank God for the gifts of the Spirit and demonstration, manifestation, and operation. And we're going on in. Amen? Hey, buddy. Yes, sir.
Father, we thank you for our brother. You said you look for somebody to intercede or hedge a gap. Father, we thank you as he stands in the gap tonight. Father, we just set our faith with him right now in Jesus' name that this is done concerning this family member. Father, you're moving, you're working, whether it's through him or others. That seed is being sown and acted upon him. We thank you that he's saved in Jesus' name, making Jesus Lord of his life. And we thank you right now, even with our brother that stands here. You've ministered to him by the word and the spirit. He's making some adjustments and he's going out of here tonight seeking first the kingdom of God in a greater measure and I just see him sit back down in that flow Father that you so will and desire and he's going to move forward and go and accomplish your will your best for his life your plans and purposes we count it done and so by faith in Jesus name amen and amen love you buddy thank you Lord Jesus yes yes Father, we thank you right now for Mr. Kenny. We thank you for the hand of God upon him. We set our faith with him right now in accordance to the word. You said if any two people come together, Lord, the touching whatever we agree on is done in your name. You said all sickness and disease you placed upon the Lord Jesus. He carried it so we wouldn't have to. So we thank you, Father. He's acting now. And we're acting together now on the seat of the word that says by the stripes of Jesus, he's healed and whole. These things are made clear and open now in Jesus' name, functioning just as you created them to. In Jesus' name, because as he said for years, I've heard him. With long life, are you satisfying him? With long life, are you satisfying him? And we thank him living out his years, not just scratching by, but living out his years, healthy, wealthy, and wise in Jesus' name. We're in agreement with him that it's done in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Appreciate you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. God is good. Amen. Are you glad you come to church? We are. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad I'm here. Most of all, we're glad the Lord is here. Got the men's fellowship, 8 o'clock at the clubhouse. The address is on the thing out here. They provide biscuits and all that kind of stuff. Jay don't want one, but y'all can have his, Grant. Yeah, Jay's. But we'll we'll uh, be there. Going to have a good word then, good brotherhood. Iron sharpens iron, right? Yep. And then Sunday, ready to go again. We love you. We appreciate you. Be blessed in Jesus' name.